So, good morning. Welcome to the first meeting of the Ozege University's Department of International Relations Workshop on Politics and Society, right? That's the name we've chosen. Yeah. Uh, my name is Konstantinos Stravros, I'm an assistant professor of international relations here, in case you didn't know. <laughs> Uh, supposedly, you should be able to see my email down there to send me comments. It's not a very good choice of color. It's constantinos.travelos.ozeg.edu.tr. So today I'm going to talk to you about war aversion and the causes of major power managerial coordination. This is based on my dissertation, which was on the effects of major power managerial coordination. So now what I am doing essentially is solely building a story about how the major powers come to essentially engage in managerial coordination. I would like to ask you if you could hold all of your questions for the end of the talk for the Q&A. Now, let's start with some current, current events. And it's a bit too bright here, so you can see the two faces. But we have over here Vladimir Putin, president of the Russian Federation. Over here, Barack Obama, president of the United States of America. And over the last years, people have been discussing essentially, especially this year, that we have essentially entered a new Cold War. Gorbachev yesterday came out and said we are entering a new Cold War. And at the very least, we are talking and we are witnessing the collapse of a peace regime. Uh, now, I don't personally think that we are in a new Cold War yet, but definitely without any question, the quality of major power coordination has degenerated over the last 10 years, both because of the United States and Russian adventurism. So without a doubt, it's nowhere close to what it was in the 90s and early 2000s. This might have really bad uh, consequences for peace. And I can say that because we have an increasing amount of evidence that increasing major power managerial coordination is associated with a decrease in the incidence of war and militarized interstate disputes. These are uses of force between states that do not rise to the intensity of war, but they can still kill people. So they're not exactly safe things. In the international system, we have quantitative evidence. Wallenstein's words in 1984, my own dissertation tackled this matter. And we also have qualitative evidence, especially the work of Randall, Miller, and Steiner. So without any doubt, we know, or at least we have very good reasons to believe, that increasing major power managerial coordination tends to foster peace. And that its lack in the international system, even if we can't say 100% will actually lead to war, at the very least denies peace one of those fostering conditions. So we should be worried that uh, this decrease in managerial coordination between the great powers is taking place. Now, here's a puzzle. Managerial coordination, as conceptualized by me in my dissertation, essentially is made up of three elements. Consultation, multilateralism, and the avoidance of adversarial coordination. These are essentially types of behavior which really constrain major power foreign policy freedom. In another name, when the major powers are engaged in managerial coordination, they're essentially denying themselves uh, the freedom to do whatever they want in their foreign policies. In many ways, it's a case of self abnegation Well, the issue here is that major powers are not exactly the type of states, and especially the elites that govern them, that are known for their self-restraint. They're the most powerful states in the system. There's a lot of ego that comes with the prestige of being a major power. And you know, there's a good question there. Why would they accept such constraints in the pursuit of peace? Because if you want peace, there might be more opportunistic uh, alternatives to managerial coordination, such as you know, non-aggression pacts, uh, alliances, the creation of spheres of influence, which don't require as much constraint. So that's a puzzle. Why would they ever do this? Why would they accept? significant restrictions on their ability to do politics in order to get a durable peace. My argument in a nutshell is that they're not doing this because they're altruists. Indeed, they are doing this because they're very egoistical agents who care about everything else about the security of their power. What essentially happens is war 
and specific types of war, as, as I'm going to explain, create cracks or threaten the domestic power structure that assures that the domestic elites will remain as the dominant political agents in a country. So specific wars, either due to war weariness, which is essentially the situation in which the population gets sick and tired of war and wants the war to stop. And if the elites don't listen, the population might decide to do to them what the Russians did to Nicholas II, which is overthrow and execute them in pretty greasy ways. Or because war makes immense demands on the social and political structure of the country, especially demands for equality and representation, which was the case of the nationalist wars of Otto von Bismarck, the more wars Germany fought, the more democracy people demanded. So at some point Bismarck decided democracy is bad for what I'm trying to do. So let's try to limit it. So let's avoid wars. So because of war weariness or the fear of the radical social evolutionary potential of war, great power elites become afflicted with war aversion. They come to fear war as a tool of foreign policy because they fear the political and social consequences of war for their position. So they decide to try and find ways to essentially avoid major power war. Now, there are two competing explanations for the same thing. The first one is Pinker's 2011 social and biological evolutionary story about peace, which is not really a new argument. Mueller made a similar argument about the obsolescence of war in 2002. The basic argument there is we have become more peaceful as a species and as societies. <coughs> Pinker essentially makes the case that on average, human societies and human relations have become more peaceful over the last 200, 300 years. And this is on average. So even through your society specifically, it might still be racked by internal violence, war, and crime. On average, an increasing part of humanity is becoming more peaceful. And his explanation is partly social evolution and partly biological evolution. That's a very interesting story, but here's the problem. Over here, I've put on a graph the ratio of interstate military conflict onsets and another name when a country decides to use military force against another country over the number of states in the system from 1715 to 2001. Now, as you can see, it's very hard to see it here, but the trend line for war is, is slightly decreasing. So it kind of supports, you know, if you want the argument that we have become more pacifist in that sense. But, it, you know, it's not a big decrease. It, it, it's kind of not a big deal. But if you look at the black line over here, the trend line for the onset of militarized interstate disputes has actually been going up. So maybe states have become less willing to fight each other, but there is no indicator that they have become less willing to fight each other in war, but there is no indicator that they have become less willing to use military force in international relations. States still use military force and international relations, and at least when it comes to militarized interest in disputes, that doesn't seem to be a big change. An evolutionary argument should affect the use of force period. We shouldn't be seeing this differentiation. The other counter argument will be the real politic argument, which is very simple. This is just politics as is usual. <coughs> at some point, the great powers, either because they don't have enough power, or because uh, they don't have anything to gain from war, they might come together and create this ephemeral, you know, pacific regimes that really don't count for much in international relations. You know, I don't want to, to stereotype, but this is like the offensive realist argument. These things are really like small breaks in violence. Okay, fine. You know what? Let's assume that is true. Why would they ever choose such a restrictive regime to get the results of peace? There are alternatives that are less restrictive. As I said, you can create spheres of influence. You can do compensatory regimes. You can sit down and divide third countries between you. You can just stay at your home and do nothing. And ultimately, you can make alliances. The classical 18th century 
toolkit of trying to get peace. If we accept the opportunist story, it makes no sense for the great powers to accept such big restrictions as are inherent in managerial coordination and for such a long time. The Vienna Congress lasted almost for 40 years. The post-Cold War uh, managerial coordination regime lasted almost for close to 20 years, 15 years if you want to be more restrictive. That's a long period for a great power to say, I'm not taking advantage of my power. And to say, oh, this is just an opportunistic thing. We're ready at any moment to jump on the barbarian war. So because of that, I think that the argument I'm making about war weariness and the fear of radical potential can explain why the pursuit of peace can take this specific form. So let's try and answer. Now, we know from past literature that war can lead to a willingness to engage in managerial coordination or to try to create regimes that will create peace in international relations. Even offensive realists and defensive realists will accept this. Uh, Headley Bull, for example, talks about great power cooperation as one of the regimes for peace in the international system. But let's build a theory, or at least an explanatory story, under which conditions this willingness to cooperate will lead to managerial coordination. Let's start by two assumptions. The first assumption is that elites in government, above all else, wish to remain in power and preserve the best of domestic power structure. In another name, the people who rule a country above everything care about continuing to rule the country. This doesn't necessarily mean that they must always be in power, but it means that the, their ability to gain power must always be open. In another name, they must not be blocked from power. So this can accommodate even democracy in which you have changes of which elites are at any one point the government, but it's an open game. Nobody is restricted from taking part in the game. And I would even argue that they are willing that they care so much about this that they were willing at times to even sell their country to foreign powers. The classical example of this is the Polish elites during the 18th century, who essentially, in order to maintain their dominant position within the country, sold the country to Catherine the Great. So that's the first assumption, that their preference, their main goal, is to remain in power. The second assumption is that they are rational that the Lisbon government are rational, which simply means if they face three or four or two different options, they will always choose the option that maximizes their ability to gain number one, to remain in power. Now, how does war cause war aversion? First, war is costly in life and material. People resent the extraordinary financial and human burden of warfare. They don't like conscription. Uh, the happy people who go to conscription in the 20th century are an, a very big, how can I put it, anomaly in the history of the human race. Normally people hate conscription. They don't like it and they don't like it for a long time. They don't like it not only because you're talking away their children, their husbands, their sons, in most of history men have been used in war, but you're also denying them economic agents, okay? Think about it, if you're a peasant family in 19th century Turkey, in the Ottoman Empire, and war happens and your son is taken away from you, that probably is one third to one half of your economic productivity there's a very good chance you're not going to be able to eat next year because of that. Beyond that, governments have always used war as an excuse to place extraordinary taxation, extraordinary restrictions, and so on. So people don't like it. They're willing to tolerate it to a certain point, but once that point has been passed, war weariness kicks in. The people get sick and tired of the war. They don't want more war. They want peace. They start demanding from the leaders either win the war today or end the war today. If that means you have to accept a bomb deal, you have to accept a bomb deal. And if the leaders refuse or fail to accommodate those demands, there is a good chance that the resentment of the people towards war is going to change to an enmity towards the state. 
And that enmity towards the state can take many forms, from the more simple sabotage forms, for example, massive desertion, to the more serious forms of rebellion, like in Russia in 1917, where the government is essentially overthrown because it refuses to stop fighting. The second thing is societal and political changes fueled by demands for the results of war. The people whose blood and treasure is expended in war are not likely to return from the war and accept the status quo that existed before. They are very likely to demand a bigger piece of the pie. They have sacrificed their lives, they have sacrificed their livelihood, they have lost time, money, loved ones, and they're not going to do that just so the old order can remain. They are highly likely to demand change. Change can take the form of demands for more representation, for democracy, for more social equality. These changes can undermine the very social structure that the elites have been fighting in order to maintain. A classical example of that is the creation of the Roman Republic. What happened? Rome was fighting a number of wars with other Italian city-states and states, and at some point the patrician class found that things are not going very well, so they demanded from the plebeians, come and fight for us. What the plebeians did is, if we don't get some rights, we're not fighting for you. It was the plebeian strike, and that led to the modern, yeah, the modern, the final form of the Roman Republic where plebeians had a voice. Another example would be the hoplite revolution in ancient Greece. Uh, more contemporary examples would be the demands of German liberals in the 19th century from for freedom and equality. And even more contemporary, in Eritrea, women's rights were tied to the participation of women in the wars of independence and then the wars against Ethiopia. So war has this ability to force, essentially, social change on people, on states. It's an incubator. Bismarck's fear was exactly that war would undermine the power of the state, the old societal structures of Germany. Finally, you don't actually have to participate in a war to suffer from these afflictions, especially the fear of the radical potential. Just being a major power that witnesses another major power collapsing as a social and political actor because of these things might lead your own elites to be a bit more circumspect when it comes to the use of force. This is the classical example of the 1920 powers. The Entente won the war. And they came out of the war with a lot of troubles, but they didn't collapse like Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Russia. But the experience of watching those empires collapse under the weight of the war led them to essentially try to even declare war illegal. Now, now then, you don't want to be subjected to this. Unfortunately, the sunlight hides it. It's the attack on the Winter Palace. The Soviets essentially took advantage of war weariness to overthrow the provisional government, which had been stupid enough to continue fighting World War I even though the previous government had been overthrown because it was continuing to fight World War I. They didn't listen to the war awareness of the people. They all ended up exiled or shot. So you don't want to be that. So how does war aversion lead to managerial coordination? Okay, we made an assumption. The assumption was essentially that we have Russia, we're dealing with rational actors that above everything else want to remain in power. They are going to choose managerial coordination whenever they come to the conclusion from events and historical reality that the previous tools used to you know, lead to peace have failed. In other names, they're going to choose coordination when they decide that opportunistic peace doesn't work. You need something more, a bit more substance to the peace regimes in order to actually guarantee peace. Uh, the classical example of this is the change from the 18th century to the 19th century. And the way you got peace in the 18th century was the balance of power, which really meant everybody betraying everybody else every day in this continuous shifting system of alliances, 
trying to essentially satiate the person you thought was the most threatening. And also doing compensatory politics in which if we had a trouble between us, we would cut to pieces Venetia or Poland and hopefully satisfy each other like that. That didn't work. It fed the Napoleonic Wars. So when the great powers after the Napoleonic Wars were seeking peace, they couldn't really use the old tools. They had to innovate. Social innovation comes when the previous tools fail. They had to find a new regime that could get a good balance between autonomy, the freedom of great powers to be agents of foreign policy, and peace. And that's where managerial coordination came out. But for this innovation to hold, it can't just be a thing between two, one or two powers. You need to be able to have you know, a number of great powers playing a role. Because if it's just one or two powers, what you're going to get is something very similar to the wild war Fleury policy after 1715. You had the war of Spanish succession. It was a big war, lots of dead people, lots of war weariness. But only England and France actually tried to somehow overcome the problems that had led to the war. Everybody else went back to the good old systems of 18th century politics, which means that there was no peace in Europe from 1715 to 1744. And ultimately, while there was peace between the United Kingdom and France, it collapsed. So it's not enough to just have an innovator. You need to have a condition where all the major powers to a certain degree or the majority are afflicted with aversion to war. Let me give you an example of how this works. I'm basing this example on the works of Schroeder, Sofka, and S. Dayen. They are historians who focus on the Vienna system. Now, the rise of the Vienna system in 1815 was a transformative effect because it was the first instance of major power managerial coordination that actually worked in the history of the modern international system. And there was no real attempt before that at it, and there was no successful attempt before that. 1815 is the first conscious attempt to create something new in international relations. In this case, a system of managerial coordination that would guarantee a durable peace for Europe after the Napoleonic Wars. Now, the primary innovators, and unfortunately you can't see very well over here their pictures, let me shade it. No? Yeah. yeah. The primary innovators were Prince Metternich of Austria and Viscount Custer of uh, England. We know from the work of historians, especially the work of Sofka and Metternich, that both of them approached the Congress system with the idea that this has to be something fundamentally new in international relations, that it has to be something different than before. Uh, Metternich was a radical in a way. He was radical in international relations because he wanted to essentially create a system that rejected the old balance of power logic. And he was driven to it partly by Enlightenment uh, philosophy as Sofka points out, new ideas, and also partly by a belief that the old system was dangerous to Austria. But if Austria tried to build peace the way it tried to build peace in the 18th century, Austria would end up destroyed as a great power. Because it very, very, came very close to getting destroyed as a great power with the Napoleonic Wars. It was occupied twice by Napoleon. Kasternik also was driven partly by enlightened philosophy and also partly by the understanding that the English people had enough for war. Throughout the Napoleonic Wars, England had been tested. There was an Irish revolt, there were popular movements against the war, there was economic uh, problems, and well, by 1815, the United Kingdom had come up on the top and everything seemed to be fine and dandy. There was a belief that the continuation of the war or a reversion to a new war could threaten the social stability of the United Kingdom. These two innovators were supported by Alexander I, who is always a very weird character in this story. Alexander I was somebody who liked to believe that he was an innovator. He was very much believing in the ideas of the Enlightenment, and he too wanted to see 
a new system in Europe. But he didn't come up with the idea. However, partly because of his belief that he's an innovator and partly because he remembered what happened to his father, Paul I, who was essentially overthrown and executed by his own guard because of his policies during the war, Alexander also wanted to avoid a future great power war. So you had three innovators who were working together and then you had a bunch of opportunists. The greatest opportunist, of course, was Tyler on the front. Now, Tyler I didn't care about peace in Europe and things like that and innovations. He was an 18th century politician enjoying it much the same. But he did believe that any new war in Europe would essentially be deadly for the new French monarchy that was reconstituted uh, because, first of all, Napoleon, the, the, Napoleon and his supporters fed from war. Uh, secondly, the people were sick and tired of war. They would not support it. And the third level was a personal one. Let's be frank, if Napoleon got his hands on Tyler after 1815, he would have ended up dead in a very, very, very vicious way. So peace was an opportunistic decision, but because he needed and wanted peace, he ended up following the innovators. The only people who were really hardcore opportunists were Hardenberg of Prussia, who didn't want a managerial system. He wanted essentially an alliance with Russia, which would permit him to divide Central Europe and push everybody else. Well, Hardenberg tried to destroy the innovation, he tried to undermine it, but unfortunately for him, his king, Frederick William III, while not an idealist by any way, was really scared of war. Because during the Napoleonic Wars, Prussia got occupied once, it lost its prestigious status as a great power, and what is wars? All of those nice nationalist movements that rose to fight in Germany against Napoleon, they kind of threatened the king that if he doesn't join them, he will be overthrown. So when you're a monarch, even one instance of that is very scary. So what happened essentially is that thanks to the fact that multiple major powers had suffered some conditions of war weariness or fear of the radical potential of war, the innovators were able to either overcome the resistance of opportunists like in the case of Hardenberg, or lure them into the system. And once the system started, it became sticky. They learned how to play through those regimes, and there was an incentive by great power elites to maintain the system because it, they had already sacrificed so much to create it. Now, the problem here is that that's a great example, okay? Beautiful, I chose it on purpose. And obviously, when you choose an example of purpose, you always choose the best example you can to support you. Uh, it's not enough to persuade us. First of all, because there's counterexamples. The classical one I've already talked about is the War of Spanish Succession. It was a big war. But 1715 was not 1815. That's a puzzle I'm interested in looking at the future, but for the time being, it points out that we cannot assume that war weariness and the fear of radical potential of war will always lead to managerial coordination. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to conduct a large end study in which I'm going to try to see which types of war are more likely to engender managerial coordination, to foster it, and how often they do. To do that, we need to categorize wars. We need to answer the question what kind of wars are more likely to cause war aversion. Unfortunately, there is no theory to guide us there. The war weariness uh, work in international relations, unfortunately, is a bit hard theoretical, especially when it comes to thoughts about what kind of wars will lead to war weariness. Everybody assumes it's World War I and World War II and the Napoleonic Wars. There is actually no typology. There is no theory to tell us what we should expect. So, I'm trying to create a typology here. It's, it's very primitive, very unsophisticated, but it's a start. What I do is essentially, first of all, operationalize our concepts. Operationalize war weariness as wars that are costly material and bodies. So, since we don't have very good information about wounded, 
and killed in wars, but we have very good information about numbers of people mobilized in wars. I essentially create a measure which looks at abnormal increases in the military establishment of states, especially when those are repeated annually. And what I do is I find the average increases in militaries within the period from 1715 to 1815 and 18 to 2001, and then I locate those wars that had above that. Okay? When it comes to the second way I operationalize war weariness is longer than average in duration wars. As we said, people don't like suffering these things, especially if they last time. Everybody's happy the first year of the war. Oh, well, not everybody. But let's say you can tolerate it for a year. Conscription, extraordinary taxes. Maybe you can tolerate it for two years. And you know what? If the last war lasted five years, maybe you can even tolerate it for five years. But six years, seven, eight years, once you start to see the length of the war as abnormal, something outside of historical experience, especially your immediate historical experience, you're not going to be happy. So what I do is I found the average length of wars in my two periods, and then I know that which wars were more than that. I can tell you that in the 1816-2001 period, the average length is two years. So anything above two years is very long. Uh, in the 18th century, the average length is five years. So everything about 10 years is abnormal. Finally, in order to operationalize the concept of the fear of the radical potential of war, I look at which wars were characterized by conditions that undermine the authority of the state. Because remember, the fear of the radical potential is that the war is not necessarily going to tire the people, but it's going to lead the people to make demands for changes. Well, it's very hard to capture this. So I sat down and I thought something very simple. What type of events in war undermine the authority of the state? Well, the first one is siege or captures of capitals. Why? Well, think it about this way. When your capital is taken, that breaks down the authority of the state. You lose the ability to rule the country. The second one uh, is the loss of major power status. Losing prestige because you are not a major power anymore might lead your elites and your population to question whether you should still govern. The final one is violent internal problems. It's not necessary that a war cause the violent internal problems, things like coups, civil wars, rebellions, or you know the use of force against civilians by the state itself. But if those things happen contemporaneously at the same time, there's a good chance that the elites will assume that those events are tied to the war. So what I do is I divide all the wars between 1715 and 2001 into four categories according to how likely they are to inflict the participants with one of these war aversion conditions. So we have wars that are highly likely to, impose, to inflict both war awareness and fear of the radical potential of war. We have wars that are highly likely to inflict fear of radical potential and only moder moderately likely to do war weariness. We have wars that have a mediocre likelihood of inflicting a fear of the radical potential of war, but no likelihood of inflicting war weariness. And then we have wars that are likely to inflict uh, war weariness, but not the fear of the radical potential of war. And I focus on those wars that, are mu that have multiple major power participants. And the wars are essentially World War I and World War II. Kind of makes sense likely to do both. The revolutionary Napoleonic wars, I've decided to treat them as one category since everybody does that anyway. The 1848 wars, which were a set of wars by themselves, but if you take them as a whole, and there are reasons to take them as a whole, because the ideas that led to them were common, and also a lot of the participants will go from one revolution to the other. Garibaldi is the classical story here. The war of the Austrian succession, and in the final category, you have the Korean War, the Seven Years' War, the Crimean War. These are the most likely wars to inflict war aversion because they can inflict the conditions that make up war aversion and also they have multiple participants that can inflict it. 
which means they are highly likely to lead to managerial coordination. Because it's not going to be just one great power that wants to innovate, it's probably going to be two or three. The dependent variable is the scale of major power managerial coordination intensity. And this really just, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it, I'd be happy to talk to the Q&A about it. This simply measures how much the major powers participate in consultation, multilateralism, and the avoidance of adversarial coordination. I do two models. The first model is a major power year. And the question here is, does a major power in the 20-year period after a war aversion condition happens in a war, that means the 20 years after something that can cause war aversion happened in the war, engage in positive activity towards managerial coordination. So you're in the war, your capital is captured. In the 20 year period after that event, do we see you as a great power trying to increase managerial coordination by your actions? The second one is a system year uh, design in which the question is, does major power managerial coordination increase in the 20 year period after a war? So in the first one, I care about the individual behavior of major powers. In the second one, it's their collective behavior. The first one is essentially 20 year periods for each major power that was a participant in a war. The second one is 20 year periods after a war. Here's the quick and dirty findings, and if you want to go a bit more deep into them, we can talk about them in the Q&A. Wars, high war weariness, and fear of a radical potential of war tend to have a highly positive, significant association with a major power that took part, that had this event happen to it, engaging in positive steps towards managerial coordination. Uh, it's still positive when we look at the collective behavior of the major powers, they tend to be associated with increasing managerial coordination, but it's not that strong, okay? Wars high in war weariness, in another name, wars that only cause war weariness, but do not cause a fear of the radical potential of war, they have no effect on the behavior of major powers as individuals, and they actually have a negative, slightly statistically significant effect on the, the collective behavior of the major powers. Wars that are only high in fear of radical potential but don't cause war weariness have a very strong positive statistically significant effect and influence either on the individual behavior of major powers towards positive steps for managerial coordination or their collective. So what's going on here is essentially is that it seems that the Fear of radical potential of war is a much stronger fostering factor for managerial coordination than war weariness. Uh, it also means that it is true that managerial coordination tends to follow from wars that tend to score high on conditions that might cause war aversion. So, yes. Wars with a high potential to inflict multiple major powers with war weariness and fear of the radical potential of war are likely to lead to managerial coordination. Great. So, if we want to see more major power coordination nowadays, we should uh, expect that Russia and the United States fight a war and it's a very terrible war. Well, I'll talk about that later on. There's a problem and it's a very pessimistic uh, finding. It seems that war weariness is less conducive to such policy change than fear of the radical potential of war. In another name, our elites only care about their thrones. They don't really care about our misery. You can have a society that is racked by war weariness, the bodies of the dead, you know, coming, piling up, the economy destroyed. But as long as the people don't rebel and threaten the social and political order, the elites are completely happy to continue fighting on. And they are completely happy to risk more wars in the future. However, the moment that the war creates conditions that threaten the political order of the society, and they don't like war then. They become very pacifist. So the implications for future research are three. 
I'm not saying that there should be a war between the United States and Russia in the future in order for us to see increased managerial coordination. However, it will be interesting to ask whether there are international phenomena other than interstate war that can lead to major power managerial coordination, maybe create the kind of conditions that are tend to be conducive to major power managerial coordination. A possible example would be the collapse of the Soviet Union and the effect it had on the, the Russian foreign policy. Now, many people would say Russia was submissive because it couldn't do anything else. Well, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea is not that strong either, but it's not very submissive. So I would argue Russia could have made the life of the United States of America very terrible, even after the end of the Cold War. But it didn't because, in many ways, the collapse created similar conditions to those that a great war would go create when it comes to foreign policy choices. Secondly, this raises the question of whether it might be rational for the population to always be disloyal in times of war in order to force the major powers to make peace and more importantly to, pee, to build durable peace regimes. It might be very rational to bring rebellious and demanding if the goal is peace. And finally, why do some wars sometimes fail to engender major power and coordination, and why some do? One of my future research projects for next semester is essentially comparing 1715 to 1815 and trying to answer the question of why did they fail in 1715? That's about it. Thank you very much for your uh, attention and time, and I'm very willing to and looking forward to your questions. Present it because uh, uh, okay. I didn't want to present the control so, variables. Uh, like in a democratic system, mm -hmm. I would expect, like not democratic, typical, competitive system with full franchise, mm -hmm. not necessarily liberty. Um, in a competitive system with full franchise, war um, revolutionary option mm -hmm. would be less 
frightening. It feels mm -hmm. like I'm not sure. It feels like, and then in a um, authoritarian regime with mm -hmm. uh, no inclusion. So does it matter? Does the like? Do you somehow mm -hmm. assume an authoritarian government, mm -hmm. which will be fearful of the uh, change in yep. the regime matters? That's one. And mm -hmm. second, uh, so do we assume a non-conflictive regime? Mm -hmm. Right. And the second one is, um, what if? That would be, I can totally envision certain situations where expansion of franchise, which is very much created by war mm -hmm. and mobilization, in Taliban's article 1979, mm -hmm. I think um, that's the main cause of democratization internally. Um, either mobilization after the war, mm -hmm. after the war you have to expand, or before the war mm -hmm. you, know, you have to recognize so that you can yes. conscript them, right? They vote in rights, citizenship rights, etc. Mm -hmm. so, um, there would be certain situation in a competitive regimes where uh, more war mobilization and ensuing uh, ex expansion of franchise would be beneficial to the leaders in power, mm -hmm. right? Because they would be more likely to lose an election mm -hmm. in a narrower franchise. Whereas, so like, do we assume also like a kind of right wing government which does not want mm -hmm. inclusion of uh, lower classes? Mm -hmm. So those two are like. Very much related, I think, and I have other questions, but this okay. one I wanted to interject. Regime question. Mm -hmm. Well, regime question, and I think they are about like the relationship between the elite and the masses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So the first question, actually, the coding of every war's potential was based on the participation of each of each great power. So I don't call the war as high simply because of the war itself. I call it high because seven of the eight major powers were affected. Seven of seven major powers were affected. Uh, five of five major powers were affected. Three of five. So it's not just coding the whole war. It's also coding the specific participation of each power. So when I say in high war willingness and fear of radical potential, it doesn't mean just the war in general, but it also means that for a majority of the participants, that was the case. Uh, I, I can't show the really convoluted Excel sheet I used to call this, but essentially it has every can, every great power that participated in a war, and next to it, in each war, a table that says, like, did it have a coup, did it have an internal revolution, did its capital become besieged, did it lose, and so on. So this is actually granular information. Uh, now, on the regime issue, well, on, on, the, on the issue of, you know, do the major powers think, do the elites think that the war has a radical potential or is war weary, or do they actually see it? Well, first of all, it's very hard to discriminate at this in a statistical study. And it's probably really hard to even do it in a qualitative case study because you'll have to know a lot of languages to be able to capture all the great powers. But I will make the case that the great powers, the elites, react to what they see is going on. So they react to essentially popular demands. Now, it's true, when I'm coding war weariness, I'm not really coding popular reaction to those conditions. I'm coding those conditions and assuming they will always cause war weariness. I think that's a safe assumption in the sense that you will get war weariness. It's just not necessarily that the people will actually express that war weariness. So, you know, in a future more sophisticated statistical study, the key will be to code whether there was you know, popular unrest because of world weariness. Uh, uh, so, but even in that case, the elites will change their views about the war only once they see indicators that the war is going bad for them. Uh, these are powerful indicators. Uh, in the case of uh, the fear of radical potential, we're talking about things like coups and, and attempted coups. We're talking about rebellions. We're talking about you know massive use of military force against civilians in the Napoleonic Wars. <laughs> England put down a couple of uh, Chartist movements using pretty massive force by English standards, uh, which essentially means you know that I'm not capturing necessarily the thoughts of the uh, elites, but if they're going to change their thinking, they're going to change their thinking after these events not before them. Why? Because there's a status quo bias in politics. Uh, whether you have left-wing or right-wing elites, they're all status quo. They're all conservatives. They don't like change. And, you know, it's not enough that you get somebody like Metternich, who's read, read, read a bit, you know, enlightenment and has decided, oh, I want to change the world. 
You also need to persuade the emperor. You also need to persuade the Prince Liechtenstein. So it's not enough that you get one person. You have to have a lot of members of the elites decide that it must be changed, or at least tolerant of attempts to change. And they're only going to do that when they have powerful indicators that things are not going well. Now, when it comes to democracy, here's what I can say. I did control for monadic democracy, and as you can see over here, when it comes to the interesting, uh, you know, when it comes to democracy, the only interesting design is the major power year design. It, it, it doesn't have a statistically significant influence on the decision. So whether you are in a democracy or not a democracy, there is no difference in your decision to engage in managerial coordination if you have been afflicted by war aversion. Now, this democracy, this is polity democracy. And polity is not the perfect measure of democracy. It's, it's a good measure of competitiveness. You know? So at least this shows that differences in competitiveness don't make as big a deal. Whether you are a democracy or whether you are an autocracy, when the people start getting angry about the war, you are going to react. Denise, you have your hand up. You want to... Well, it was blatant. Yes. Uh, I mean, if you're looking at the period 1715 to 2001, yes. The number of democracies yeah, yeah, it's is very, very, few. very, very few. It's very few. So the end is very small. I got yeah. to be one reason why there is no significant. That, that might be the case, but uh, there, you have to remember that there are not that many states before uh, 1815. So adding 17 to 18 doesn't really bias. I mean, you still get more observations after 1816 and many more observations after 1920 than compared to 1815. I, I've run it for 1816 to 2001, and sometimes it's statistically significant, sometimes it's not. It really depends on which of the categories you put in. Uh, I mean, control variables, and to be frank, there are not that many control variables I can have throughout this whole period. The only other one is state age, and even state age is positively associated. So the older a country is, the more likely it is to engage in peace. We can kind of build a story about that, which is essentially the older a country is, the more set its institutions, the more confident and stuff like that, but that's a story. Not necessarily, you know, but I think you have a point there in that if a state is gonna survive for long, it has to somehow, you know, take into consideration and manage competitive demands. Now, when it comes to things like the expansion of the franchise mm -hmm. and also you know what would fear of political radical change in a democracy look like well, first of all the expansion of the franchise you have we have to understand is a radical change in a democracy because it completely changes the way and who can take part in politics uh, and while it can be very very uh, beneficial to the elites to do it history shows that most of them don't like doing it they tend to be resistant uh, so even if some of the government elites want to do it, the majority are going to be very resistant and they're probably only going to accept it after a war. Uh, also, those elites that don't want to do it at all can see the writing on the walls like Bismarck and see that war equals democracy. I don't like democracy, I can't like war. It's not necessary, you know, if you're able to play the war in a smart way like Bismarck is, you can get away with it, but you're always going to have these demands for more participation because people demand to be rewarded. So in democracy, what it will take the form. So maybe the expansion of the franchise will be a consideration, an event. But, you know, coups still happen in democracies. And there are a lot of democracies, democratic major powers that have fallen because of war. Uh, the French Third Republic essentially was overthrown because of defeat in World War II. Uh, the provisional government of Russia, whether it's democratic or not, is up to debate, but it fell because essentially of continued resistance to fight World War I. So I do think there might be the third, the third World War II. Two. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think that there is a point to talk about regime changes. But we need better measures than the positive measure, which is not granular enough. So there might be differences between, let's say, absolutist monarchies versus uh, more legitimate regimes. So Russia versus Austria-Hungary, or Russia versus Prussia. 
There might be differences between more popular democracies, let's say like France after 1871, versus the United Kingdom in 1830s, which is a bit more restrictive. Uh, I can't capture this right now. Uh, when it comes to, you know, a bit more careful reading, that's qualitative work. Uh, can it be done? I think as a couple of comparative case studies, yes. But if you're trying to compare attempts at managerial coordination, you're going to have to look at five or six different major powers and you will have to, you will really have to go down and do something like Sofka's work, which is essentially go and read Metternich's letters and see how he's thinking about this. So it's doable, but it will be a lifetime work. Yes, Ali. I have a few confirmation questions. Yes, fire away. Of course. Statistics. <laughs> Statistics. So okay. let's, let's start with measurement. So yes. The cabinet can go back to the measurement of managerial coordination. Yes. OK, so here is. Okay. Measurement for me to understand it. Like, yeah. yeah. So it's, called, mm -hmm. it's IGO membership, multilateralism. And avoidance of control coordination. Those are the concepts. Which is the, what is it? Avoidance of control coordination is when the major powers avoid creating alliances between themselves that explicitly target another major power. Okay. So an example of that will be the alliances before World War I. Oh, that's the alliance. Yeah, exactly. But they have to be specific forms of influence. So it must be major power with major power, and it must explicitly target another major power. If it's a secret clause, it doesn't count because people don't know about it. Uh, and the, th the reason for this is that, let's say you have consultation and multilateralism, and I operationalize consultation as membership in NGOs and congresses, and I operationalize multilateralism as the membership of all the major powers in an alliance, which doesn't target another uh, power. You got those two. Great, right? You have these powerful indicators of peace and harmony and cooperation. Everybody's happy. And then you have half of the major powers allied against the other half. That's completely going to undermine any pacific effect of the positive thing. So if the major powers are serious about managerial coordination, they have no choice. They have to actually take part in each of these three concepts. So what I'm doing is I'm measuring whether in each year they are taking part in consultation, multilateralism, adversarial coordination. And then I add them together, whether the president that gives me a number from two to minus one, and for statistical reasons, you know, I don't like dealing with negative numbers because I'm not that smart. I, you know, make a liner increase. And what about the uh, measurement of war weariness and mm -hmm. potential for infection? Yes, okay, so war weariness, what, what essentially, what the variable is, is it's a 20-year variable. Okay. Yes, so the dependent variable is essentially a variable that takes the form of, let's say, one, takes one for every 20, for the 20 years after uh, one of the many conditions that can cause war weariness or can cause, you know, fear of the radical potential happens. However, I add a decaying function to that. Why? Because, you know, as time passes, new generation comes, that, junior, that new generation hasn't experienced the war, they're like, yeah, let's play again the old game. So that's why I use a 20 year thing. Uh, for war weariness, for the first operationalization, what I do is I essentially subtract the personnel, the military personnel of a country in correlate to war and my own data for some information from the previous year, and I note which years had abnormal increases. And especially which years, which which churches had like annual continuous abnormal increases. So let's say United Kingdom 1715 has only a 0.001 increase. United Kingdom 1716, it goes to 2% increase. That's highly abnormal. People are probably not going to like that. The next year is 4% increase, 5% increase. So, you know, every time that happens, I quote from the last year where this abnormal increase happened. Military personnel, right? Yeah, military personnel, because that's the only information we have. It's not necessarily conscription, uh, but even if it's not conscription, I mean, Anybody, if you, if you read a bit of military history, you know that the volunteers were not always volunteers, and especially for the British Navy, where usually like they get you drunk and get you up. Uh, so, but you know, the reality is that the kind of abnormal uh, increases that I'm talking about are things like 
5% of the population mobilized for the war, which is a very high proportion. That doesn't happen a lot. Uh, it happens a bit in, world war, in the world wars, and it really happens with the Prussian and Napoleonic wars, who go crazy after 1813 and essentially mobilize close to 10% of the population to fight. So we're talking about, I don't want you to think that this is just, oh, they added another 1,000 men. We're talking about like really abnormal increases, really situations where like a substantial part of the population has been mobilized for the war, which has a big cost in lives and also cost in uh, money, because those are you know working hands that are not available. Uh, for duration, as I said, I just you know count the number of times, but I assume you know if the average war is two years, people are not gonna be much angry if a war lasts a year. A year long, a year long war is nothing. And most of us will probably even forget it within 10 years. But if it lasts a bit longer than a year, especially if it lasts more than two or three years, people are starting to wear, you know, what's going on here? Why are we winning? Uh, the last one, I have to essentially do events. So I call it events from longer. Uh, coups, Polity has a coup data set. And then, you know, for before 1815, I had to go to longer. Uh, when it comes to internal problems like use of force against people, we don't have any good data for that, which is ridiculous. We actually don't have any data set before 1990 that actually sits down and tells us, like, you know, did this country suffer a massive use of force against civilians? So I had to go back. Is it replicable? Yeah, I've given the pages. Is it valid? Depends, you know, on your definition and everything. Then I have yes. a few recommendations for border and this. Yes. There might be a problem that sometimes being able to mobilize your population might mean that you're actually capable states, mm -hmm. which might mean that you will fight longer wars. So that might be like a endogenic yeah. problem between the two variants mm -hmm. there. Capable and state. The se because not everyone will be able to mobilize all the population. So yeah, yeah, I mean, it's very rare anyway, this yeah. whole thing. Yep. One of them is that the second is when you look at the average for a 200-year period. Yes. It's kind of too long. Like, why don't you look at the average of that particular state's normal wars mm -hmm. or maybe cut the period between 1816 to 1914, 1914, 1914. Right. Well, because yeah. when you average it over such a long period, yeah. uh, is, is it the average of the war in the system? Oh, no, 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 it's, it's the average of the, it's the average duration of the war in the system. In the system though, right? Yeah. So, like... But only major power, power wars, yeah. essentially. It, the only one that's really a problem uh, is Vietnam War in the 2001 period because it's lasted a ridiculous amount of time, but the Vietnam War is highly unlikely to work because there's only one major power fighting. Uh, I could definitely try to play around. It's, it's an easy fix. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll be frank, I don't think it will change the results, but it's a good robustness check. So for the last one, so mm -hmm. you say that fear of radical potential of war now yeah. will increase the managerial coordination in the future, right? Uh, no, no. If, you, if you have an event that happens that is, that is likely to engender fear of radical potential, in the next 20 year period after that, event, I will expect you to engage in managerial coordination. I'm not saying anything after that 20 years. Okay. My, my date, my, essentially my dependent part was not close. Well, well, my question was related to that. What are you Generational change. Generational change. Uh, essentially the idea is, you know, in 20 years a new generation will have come up. It's not necessary that that new generation will continue the same policies. Also, come on, teenagers were built. So it's very likely that if you were a pacifist as a parent, your kids would be like, let's go fight! Uh, this is like, you know, overstating it. Uh, but that's also why I put in the decaying faction. Because I expect as time passes, even before those 20 years, things might become less likely because people get old, they die, they change their views. It's, you know, the war recedes in memory, it becomes this rosy story rather than this tragic story. Yes. Now I have the more questions. Yes, fire away. So, what is the dependent variable again? The dependent variable, in the first, in the first model, is a dummy variable that takes the value of one if the major power engages in a positive step towards managerial coordination. Twenty years, or well, 
in within the 20 years. Just once? Oh no, 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 it's the exact year. It is the exact year. Oh, so the exact year. So it will be like, let's say, United States, 1940, nothing. 1941, nothing. 1942, nothing. 1943. So essentially, my, my end is bounded in this 20 year period. My problem with that is, yeah. I don't know what the problem is. The problem is that if there's a major war, there's a high chance that the major coordination was already low. So you're already starting from a low point. Yes. So it's going to be yeah. really expected to increase. So do you check, do you have a control for the previous 20 years? Or? No, what I do is the way I quote it is essentially I go to my managerial coordination scale. I look at every case of increase, even if it was like a, from one to two. And then I sit down and I open my Excel where I have all the qualitative information and look why that, did that increase happen. And if the increase happened because that power did something, like say, for example, class, for example, is China entering the United Nations, that's a positive step. Uh, the other powers are still a zero. So it's stadium and everything. But what I mean is that mm -hmm. if there's a war, right. say this is a major report yeah. all the time, if there's a war, there's a high chance it's already in the law. So it, it is expected to increase after a war. Not necessarily. It will remain a one. Cold War is the classical example. It remains a one from essentially 19, uh, from 1939 with like small yearly variation. Like you have a couple, so 1939 it goes to a one. And it remains a one almost to the Helsinki Accords. The only changes are like after 1945, you have a couple of years where there's a bit cooperation before the Korean War and then it goes down again. So actually, it's not necessary that you'll get increase because the major powers might make peace but still be at each other's, you know, throats. Like no regime, no, let's say, no membership in common organizations, no Congress system, uh, adversarial alliances present. Uh, the classical example is pretty much the whole 18th century. You know, whenever a war is over, they still remain pretty much nasty to each other. Yeah, yeah, but you don't call, I don't code coordination as one because there's a war. That doesn't count in the, co in the so to put it simply, in the co construction of the scale, the event of war is not taking part. Now, there might be a pro, there might be a correlation between war happening and adversarial alliances, but it's not a high correlation. I've run it. It's not that high because adversarial alliances are actually much more common than war in international relations. They have, war is rare. Bad alliances that don't like each other before before our nice era where we have you know declared offensive alliances illegal and nobody does them supposedly. They're actually pretty pretty common. Yes, fire away. I have further questions. So you say that managerial coordination increases seem to increase after major wars, right? I, what I'm saying is in the first model major powers are more likely to engage in positive steps. In the second model, that yes, it, it tends to be increasing. It, the, the existence of uh, war weariness or fear of radical potential has a positive influence on increasing major power managerial coordination. And managerial coordination is supposed to decrease the probability of war, right? Yeah, actually not supposed, it does decrease the probability of war. So there's, is it your dissertation? Yes, that's my dissertation. But then, if it keeps increasing after major wars, why do we keep seeing major wars? Because it decreases. No, no. It keeps seeing, what, it, it increases after major wars. It does increase after a war, major war, but after the 20 year period, there's no guarantee it will continue. Remember, I'm agnostic what happens after the 20 year period after a war. Uh, secondly, managerial coordination is probabilistic. There is no guarantee that it will create peace. It fosters peace, it increases the likelihood of peace, but I'm going to be very clear I'm not making a necessity argument here because I don't believe it's a necessity argument. But generally speaking, I can say that the highest levels of managerial coordination have not seen major power war. But level, neither, but you have to remember, major power war, war between two major powers is rare. It's a rare event. Uh, it's not so rare in the 18th century where you don't have managerial coordination, but after 1816, it is actually a very rare event. And frankly speaking, if we want to make the claim that we, the war has ceased being a part of human history, which for some people mean, we can only really make that claim about major power. 
Now, major powers versus minor powers, or minor powers versus minor powers, that's a different story. But the reason I'm very interested is because this, this is a potential good measure of satisfaction, and satisfaction in the international system. Yes. It's, uh, yeah. Really yeah, it is. It, it, and it, I know it's, it's, it's not sufficient. It's, it might be necessary, but not sufficient for wars. But I want to know how much, it, like, how much does it actually matter? In my dissertation, it tended to outperform or perform as well like with things like democratic peace and also things like uh, sea power preponderance. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, my opinion is that my evidence, plus the evidence of people like Wallenstein, plus all the qualitative work on it, indicates that this is one of the keys to explaining the you know, decreasing occurrence of war. Uh, is it important anymore? Frankly, I don't know. Why? Because, you know, just because something causes peace doesn't mean that it will cause peace forever. After a while, it might create, you know, itself other fostering peaceful effects. You said, yeah. you said managerial power coordination. Managerial coordination, yes. Yeah. Uh, when it is distributed, it's sticky. It gets sticky. It's sticky, it's yeah. institutionalized. So, that was about your earlier question. Mm -hmm. uh, like, if it's sticky, yeah. it's an institution. Yeah. Uh, so, it's 20 year period, like, we should like, but I was from my, your previous, uh, so in my, I was thinking that yeah. that managerial coordination yes. is a sticky thing and that is why we are seeing that. Yes, yes. Done. That was the previous. Yes, but then right? the previous one I do wasn't using 20 years periods. I wasn't so exactly. That's why I'm, I'm only using 20 year periods for the cause of managerial coordination, not for its effects. Exactly, exactly. Uh, I understand. But yeah. When it is instituted, it can it can last, but it can also fail. There's no guarantee that it will last. For example, we had very good managerial coordination after World War II, immediately after World War II and after World War One, but it didn't last. You know, it collapsed. Especially in the case of World War II, it collapsed really fast within five years of the end of the war. So it's an attempt. That's why I call it coordination. I don't use the word cooperation. It's an attempt by the major powers to coordinate or to cooperation, but there is no guarantee that the attempt will actually succeed. It might fail. Yes? So if you are trying to explain that there's a mm -hmm. good idea to increase more controls, like import more controls, and just import power. Well, I, in, 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 my, in my dissertation where I have more data, I've included more controls. Uh, here, it doesn't make sense to control for power in the system here because First of all, we don't have really good data about it. In, in the GDP, major power GDP here... GDP data is pretty good. Huh? GDP data goes back to 1815 pretty well. It doesn't go back to 1715. It's going to 1815 and we've done it recently. I've done that in the dissertation. Uh, GDP data is not completely good because it's missing for a lot of years. It's missing for a lot of time. I've used NMC, I've used the National Military Capabilities, which is like an index. Differences between specific countries will affect how likely they're going to fight, even in the conditions of managerial coordination. But I don't, I don't necessarily want to go over my dissertation uh, in this speech because here it's more about the causes of managerial coordination and its effects. But see, you are not telling us anything except war that causes. Huh? You are not telling us anything that except war. That I haven't, I haven't thought about the possible other uh, alternative uh, cause. Uh, Number of great powers might have an effect. I've put that variable in. It's significant, but well, you could go to you could go to Ernest's uh, David Ernest's uh, paper on coordination among large groups, where he makes the case that the larger the group, the easier for them to coordinate. But again, it's not very, yeah. That, that is his actual argument. But I might be. Is said taking it. Yes. If war is the, like revolutionary, like yeah, 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 is the major cause for coordination. At, at least this is what this shows. I don't know if it's the major one because I haven't compared it to other ones. Okay, yeah. Yeah. because you know, if managerial coordination also decreases the likelihood of war, mm -hmm. so what should we expect? Yeah, you, we are we are in trouble, right? Because yeah. The peace will make it less likely that you'll have the conditions that will create the peace again. So, yeah. you know, one could explain the collapse of the managerial system that we're experiencing right now between Russia and the United States because there is very little likelihood.
likelihood of a war between Russia and the United States, they both feel that we can play a bit around more. Uh, my expectation, if you want to be to tell a big story, is that you get peace, and at some point, as time passes and uh, elites forget the, law, the lessons of war, they are less likely to coordinate, they are less likely to, more likely to fight. Uh, the problem in our days is nuclear weapons make it highly unlikely we're going to have a major power war. Which means the following, that managerial coordination might have created, might have been one of the foundations for the Pacific trend we've been experiencing over the last 200 years, but it's probably not going to be around in the future in that sense. That's fine. You know, part of my interest is in the evolution of the international system towards peaceful regimes. Beyond that, in my dissertation, I look at whether managerial coordination affects other peaceful phenomena, especially democratization and the creation of IGOs. Uh, and the, on democratization, there is a positive influence. Focus coordination over democratization. Yeah, managerial coordination tends to be associated with, uh, with increases in competitiveness in states. But would it be just to focus uh, from your ideas? I mean, I mean yeah, 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 it doesn't. I want to be very careful. It doesn't necessarily lead to democracy, no competitiveness. But it does. It does foster increases in competitiveness. Okay, managerial power coordination is perfectly uh, created to manage the yeah, yeah, system. Yeah. And then it is positively correlated. That that's a problem of story, no? It's not. No, because what happens is you still want to make sure you have peace. You're still gonna get demands for change. What happens is that the manager demands for change. Okay? If you don't manage the demands for change, you're still going to get the demands, but what might happen is you might get bored as a result of those demands. So in the case, let's say, of the Vienna system, they didn't want democracy, but they thought that legitimist reforms are required in order for peace to be maintained. Yeah, uh, I feel like if you get into the cause of democracy in the future, I don't think major power coordination is going to have any no, no. Uh, significant well, here, here, here's how it works. Am I? No, no. Here, here, the, the way it works is on the on the fact that war and the threat of war tends to retard and restrict the ability of internal players to demand change and, and leads to provide change. So peace, peace can be conducive to democratization, or more correctly, can be conducive to expansions of competitiveness, participation, and uh, I don't want to use the word democratization per se because it's not what. Policy Maybe. measures. You can find that in the dissertation if you want to read that chapter. Denise, you have your hand up. Yes, I'm in the conclusion. Mm -hmm. I have a problem with this rational disloyalty of po by population. Yes. Uh, it seems. If they all read the citation. No, no, no. I, I don't actually talk about that. This is from here. And this is just throwing an idea. This is, <laughs> this is just throwing an idea out there. Yeah. I know, but I don't like the word. <laughs> rational because I mean, rational, I mean, rational choice. Rational choice is usually about individuals. I mean, this statement says as if the population is a homogeneous point of body. That if they learn to think like that, well, it, it, it might be individuals, but you know, yeah. enough individuals are no, different. No, I totally understand your point, right. but I think you should find a different wording for like rather than rational. But I, I like it. Uh, it's an amusing. It, it, it's it's a really, it's an amusing yeah. implication. I, I wouldn't dare say you know. To people, whenever your country fights, go to the streets, rebel, demand peace, threaten to overthrow the system, demand for change, because obviously, first of all, they get shot since it's war, so governments are less willing to tolerate it. And, you know, it's not guaranteed. But, you know, from the indicators here is that they don't care if you die. You don't care about their misery. They only pursue peace when it is in their own interest. So it seems to indicate that if you want to get a stable peace as a people or individuals who have to push the elites to threaten their social structure doing war so they assume war is bad. Yeah, because sometimes, okay, if we think as a, as a population, right. of course having peace would be the you know, most rational choice that we should make. But, I mean, as I said, the population is not a coherent homogeneous body. I mean, yeah, well, yeah, but you can aggregate preferences, yeah. which can lead to rational behavior. Uh, I mean, I don't want to stress the word over there, but an example would be, you know, during the American Civil War, 
uh, at some point Floridans decided they, they had enough. You know, on an individual level, okay, people just ran away. But it was such a big number, tens of thousands, 20 of thousands of deserters. And what happened is the population of the area started supporting the deserters against the government because they thought that by supporting the deserters, they're going to undermine the war effort and thus they're going to bring peace faster. But sure, you know what? You can forget about the war. You can see, you know, smart disloyalty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Smart disloyalty, uh, utilitarian disloyalty, that's even no, worse. Is Russian disloyalty the only condition? No, 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 no. This is just this is future research. Yeah. It's not just an idea for future research. I have nothing to say about these things. These are ideas for future research. Anybody wants to sit down and write a paper, you know, a game theoretic paper about, you know, when it is rational for people to, you know, be disloyal, I would support it. These are just ideas. It seems to indicate that, you know, if you want peace, since the governments don't care about your misery and only care about their thrones, you know, even if you're not miserable, it seems you want to threaten those thrones if you want peace. But again, this is just a topic for the future. My own opinion is, I think it might be an interesting implication, but I can't say anything about it. Is it only? That's my so I have a kind of a problem with this idea of connecting further connections. This that you were talking about, right? I talked about. I asked that question actually. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of like democratization, competitiveness of tradition, opening up of tradition, right. especially for the 18th mm -hmm. century, 19th century, probably for. Um, War yes. coordination, uh, major power coordination. I think that's that's a bit redundant in terms of the idea. I kind of like I like the idea in its in this paper that mm -hmm. you presented. It's if it, there is an effect, mm -hmm. it's the effect of peace. I mean, that's yeah, yeah. what peace creates. Yeah, yeah, I don't so, disagree. So, so you start like arguing that everything that peace creates, major power coordination well, has an effect. Well, you have to. We have to have coordinate mechanisms yeah, that yeah, yeah. from coordination itself, yeah. not through peace, to democracy, not from or yes, from yes, yes, definitely. Yes. I mean, it was. Oh, I wouldn't argue. I it was not just an implication. Yeah. The mechanisms are the mechanisms of peace. The only yeah. case I would make is that peace is more likely with managerial coordination. Yeah, sure, sure, because peace is more likely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, so but it's very hard to get peace otherwise before the exactly. border era. Exactly. So like, if you make the argument for the peace, it's a perfect argument. That perfect acceptable argument, I don't know. Yeah, but you know, people will find it very boring if all I tell them is major power managerial coordination, a regime that is going away in history because yeah. major power war is going away in history yeah. and it's to peace. Yeah. They would like to see some more sexy story for the world. It's a terrible yeah, you, found, you found the cause of peace, though. Come on, it's not that. Uh, it's, it's, it's not the cause of peace. <laughs> it's a probabilistic yeah. yeah. fostering yeah. condition. Yeah. But like, the, yeah, the problem is that, you know, Kind of democracy is different literature, so a lot of people yeah. are going to be irritated. Um, yeah, they will. They, like, they, they will. Talk about causes of democracy yeah. through peace, like even like I like yes, in literature, definitely. I cannot say that peace is right. the cause of democracy. Now, I want to. I want to be very literature. clear. When I use the word cause here, I mean foster. Yeah, yeah, I don't even you. I don't even mean cause. I can't talk about causes. Okay, Statistics so cannot give you causes. We use Foster is the synonym but of fostering, fost and, fostering yeah. can be, I mean, there's considerable findings, at least in the study of international, in the peace science literature, that military conflict tends to undermine, you know, at least variables that are associated with democracy, and that the absence of military conflict tends to, you know, make more likely that you will get variables that are uh, tied to, to democracy. Is that a good theory? No. The whole theory is based on the idea that war leads to restrictions on political participation and intolerance. And if you take war away, uh, you know, you open up a space for more openings. I don't, the theory is the theory. The findings are there. They're pretty strong. But, you know, and not necessarily saying managerial coordination will lead to democracy. For that, you got to do case studies. And in the case of the Vienna system, you've got two competing situations. The logic of ma uh, managing right. should cause, should be connected. The logic of yeah. the logic itself yeah, I mean, you, 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 you have to do that on a case studies basis. Yeah, uh, 
in, in the Vienna system, it's very clear. From one point, it's very undemocratic because they oppose democracy. Democracy in the sense of popular sovereignty. On the other hand, the same powers, especially Austria and England and France that oppose popular sovereignty, do demand from absolute monarchs to essentially give constitutions, give rights to their subjects, you know, which can be considered as one of the foundations for later democratic uh, results. Uh, people forget the Vienna system was legitimist. It was not absolutist. They didn't want the return to the system where the king is the absolute monarch. They wanted a legitimate system, which means the government is legitimate as long as the government acts according to rules and laws. And I think that legit legitimism is one of those steps a country has to take in order to you know, come to popular sovereignty at some point. In that sense, you know, the Vienna system at least was conducive. The Berlin system, not necessarily. The, the post-World War II system, yes. But that's case size. Let's go with that industrialization. Come on, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, it's like managerial coordination between major powers of both polities. Right. It's just like huge industrialization that is happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but like, managerial like, coordination, like, managerial coordination itself is the uh, is a result of the Enlightenment. Yeah. The idea came first with the Enlightenment thinking. So there's no question that, but you know. It has its basis somehow. Sure, so, yeah. you know, uh, all I'm saying, all I'm saying is that this can cause peace. Peace can uh, and peace can foster other conditions among the democracy that then themselves cause with peace. In another, <laughs> peace is self-reinforcing. Okay. Should we add that because it's already in the speech? Yeah, we can. If are there, are there any other questions? Any other questions? I'm not sure this is going to be a good presentation. Thank you. Is this going to be an article? Oh, it's already under review. It's part of my article. I had to add it to. Actually, let me close this now.